Um, our presentation today is on sensitive data. And um, we'll start off. Uh, just what we're going through today, we'll, we'll start with the acknowledgement of country, and then we'll just give a bit of background. Um, today's seminar has been run by two different networks, so we'll just have a quick chat about both of the networks, and then we'll go on to have the presentation. So I'll just hand over to Louise to do the acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Maria. Um, so we just wish to acknowledge um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. Uh, we wish to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, in particular from where we are at UOW, is the Wado Wado people of the Darawal Nation. Thanks. Okay, just to give a quick bit of background about the two networks that are meeting today for the first time, we're doing a joint presentation and hopefully We'll be able to have some more um, going forward. So um, the first one I'm coordinating, I'm Marika Batterham, and that's the UAW Data and Decision Science Network. And there are four components to this network. We have a research focus where we're trying to bring together researchers from um, UAW who are interested in data and decision science. We have an education theme where we provide training in data science and reproducibility of research. And that's to our staff and postgraduate students. But we're also focusing on looking at our undergraduate subjects as well and refocusing those on data science. And the final component is external and industry engagement. And we're trying to capitalize on existing links that we have with external partners there. So I've just given the website at the bottom there for the network. And um, it's consistent with a recent report that came out from the Australian Academy of Sciences that's looking at focusing on data science skills and developing those skills in universities. And now Louise will talk about the EBI um, bio network. Uh, I don't have um, official slides, so just a, a couple of points. Um, the um, Illawarra Shellhaven and the Biostats Network was set up in 2019 um, to create a, a space for people from the health district, from, um, from the PHN in the university to um, network, get to know each other, um, and present some of the more technical aspects of their work. Um, so we've got over 40 members and we meet quarterly. Um, so although it's focused on people near the Rochelle Haven uh, network, we have lots of visitors come along and anyone's welcome to join. Um, we usually have presentations, a mix of um, national and local speakers and people presenting work in progress. Um, so it's also part of the um, goals of the Centre for Health Research in the Rochelle Haven population, um, which is a research partnership between the Rochelle Haven Local Health District, the School of Medicine and ASRI here at, um, at UOW. Um, and part of that capacity building role is to improve um, capability in statistics and epidemiology for clinicians and researchers. So um, we're very happy to be jointly um, hosting um, uh, Marika's group as well. Okay, thanks. And now I'll introduce our guest speaker today. Um, Felicity is the Manager of Policy and Client Services for the Australian National Data Linkage Infrastructure, the Population Health Research Network. Felicity has extensive experience in national data linkage systems, and she also has a great deal of experience in research ethics. And in, in addition to that, Felicity is a Churchill Fellow. So I'll hand over to Felicity. Just stop sharing my screen now so you can share yours. Thank you, Marika, for your very kind introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep. Thumbs up. Excellent. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. It's, it's lovely to be virtually back in Wollongong. Um, I should start by um, saying that I'm talking to you today from the lands of the Wujak people of the Noongar Nation. and I'm going to talk to you about linked sensitive data. Just a let's a touch of the sort of introduction to what it is, how we link data, how you might access data. Um, and I should now. This is not moving. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about 
data in general, what sorts of data we're talking about in my world, um, which I should acknowledge is not exclusively health, but we do link a lot of health data. Um, so other human services data too, but health data is what I know best, I suppose. Um, and I also should say that I have a very strong interest in ethics and law and governance, but I'm not really going to talk a lot about that today. So um, if that's something of interest to you, maybe another time. Um, so <coughs> let's get started. I think it's always good to start with a definition. So what's data linkage? Um, well, in very simple terms, it's a method of bringing together information derived from different sources, but relating to the same individual or event into a single file. So it's a pretty simple concept that is all over the place. Um, and can we bring it together and find out if data from about me is in two different data sources, for example. The kinds of data that we're talking about is the data that's collected about all of us from the time that we're born until the time that we die. Um, so throughout your life, enormous amounts of information are collected from your birth record to your school enrollments to when you visit a doctor or a hospital, you get married, you have a baby, you pay your taxes. Um, all of this information is collected about you every day of your life. Um, and it's collected by different organisations in different jurisdictions. And this, these kinds of records typically contain information about our identity, so name, address, date of birth. <clears throat> and then there's other information in the record about what happened when we went to hospital, what was our diagnosis or our treatment, <clears throat> in our school enrolment, what school did we go to, um, what were our exam results, those sorts of things. <clears throat> and I might refer to these as the identifiers and the content information. So name, address, date of birth, identifiers, and everything else in a record I often refer to as content data. So, um, and these, all of these records are captured in different systems and we require data linkage to connect the information in order to conduct research service evaluation planning sorts of things. So let's be clear about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm talking about identifiable data or potentially identifiable data. Data about individual people. Sometimes we call it person level data. Some people call it unit record data. Um, but whatever words we use, we're talking about data that is about individual persons and would most likely meet the Privacy Act definition of personal information. Um, I'm not going to talk about open data, aggregate data, any of these other kinds of data today. So, these are the, I've sort of categorized data into four different types. I'm sure you could think of other ways of categorizing data, but in, in my world, we do a lot of work with administrative data. And by administrative data, we mean data that's collected in the course of providing a service, often by government agencies, but not always. I would count private hospital data as also as administrative. So the kinds of health administrative data are things like hospital admissions, births, deaths, disease registries, think cancer registries, notifiable diseases, those sorts of things. The MBS, the PBS data, which are claims data. And then there's a whole lot of what we might call social data, education, housing, justice, child protection, disability, community welfare, police, all of this data collected by these agencies about everybody in the population is administrative data. Then we've got clinical data. So that specific clinical data collected by healthcare providers. So e-medical records, pathology, imaging, et cetera. Then I'm sure we've got a lot of researchers in the audience. So the kinds of information that researchers collect, so research specific data, um, 
you collect all sorts of different types. So longitudinal cohort data, things like the 45 and up study, the RAIN study, the Australian longitudinal study on women's health. Then there's clinical trials. So any kinds of trials about um, therapeutic interventions that might be devices, they might be pharmaceuticals or they might just be um, different kinds of practice. Um, surveys, focus groups, qualitative data, uh, biobanks, of course. So lots of research data is collected. And then not something I've had a lot to do with yet, but more and more, um, what I'm calling individual health and well-being data. So that's the data that essentially you're collecting on yourself. So all of the wearable tech, your Fitbits, your I, um, Apple Watches, all that sort of stuff, collecting information about you, as well as um, tech that might be provided to you by healthcare providers, uh, cardiologists or um, sleep physicians often send you home uh, to wear or measure stuff about you. Uh, and then of course, we shouldn't forget genomic and genetic um, information and things like, you know, 23 and me and such. So vast amounts of information being collected about us and different types. Um, but to use, and obviously there's enormous benefits that could come from using this for research. Um, but the use of this data for research requires the interests in the research to be weighed against a range of other interests, including moral and human rights issues. And the authorizing environment to access this data for research is complex and it involves a web of legislative and ethical requirements, which I'm not going to discuss today. But the methods that we use to link and access data are part of the response to these issues. So just to make sure you're aware that that's why things are lengthy and difficult. Um, this is just another. Um, nice diagram to remind you that yes we're collecting data across the life course from cradle to grave and that in Australia our health system is quite complex um, there are bits of it so we have states and territories who collect information like births perinatal and midwives data education data the hospital re records the disease registries um, and death records whereas the commonwealth government collects uh, MBS, PBS, some education data, veterans affairs, ageing data, and then we also have a private sector. So different types of organisations, different levels of government all collect data. Um, and we live in a federation, and I'm sure the experience of COVID has made you all realise that we live in a federation and states do things differently. It's important to keep in mind. So why would we link this data at all? Um, research using linked data can have a significant impact on health and human services. And the kinds of research we can do using linked data are investigating common and rare diseases and events, real world evaluation of policies and services. So there's a whole lot of, some people like to talk about real world data and that's the kind of data that we link. Um, so you can, if you brought in a policy in, 2005, you can look at what happened before you brought in the policy and what happened after you brought in the policy, for example, using longitudinal um, administrative data that's linked. Um, we can study the origins, including the social or origins associated with conditions and outcomes of disease, and we can use linked data to monitor health and well-being of Australians across the lifespan. So you can do, for example, you know, va vaccine effectiveness studies or we can look at incidents of cancer and stuff. So all sorts of things. So the main areas that we think about using linked sensitive data is to improve health services, to develop new therapeutics, to look at issues around healthy aging. There's quite a lot of work done on social impacts on health. Increasingly, we're seeing more projects on environmental impacts on health and prevention of emerging diseases is also a potential thing we could use linked data for. So I'm just going to give you a couple of um, examples of types of research that have used linked data. Um, I've tried to steer clear from the pure health ones. Um, so this one's about prisoner health. Um, and this is a group from University of Melbourne who have done 
actually a whole range of really fabulous work. Um, also in Queensland and Western Australia, so they've done a lot of stuff um, looking at prisoner health and they link together surveys they conduct with prisoners with administrative health data, including Commonwealth data, uh, data like Medicare, PBS and the National Death Index as well to look at um, what happens to prisoners after they're released from jail. And the next one is more of an environmental one. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that um, there was a product called Mr. Fluffy Insulation that was installed in thousands and thousands of ACT homes. And the ACT government used linked data to look at the health risks for the families who lived in these homes. So they had to find everybody who'd lived in a house with Mr. Fluffy asbestos insulation and then link that those people, their housing records to their cancer and hospital records. Um, and there was a, a, a nice sort of community aspect to this. So they had lots of community meetings and things around this project, which showed in the end that there was a slight risk um, of increased risk of cancer, but people generally felt that they'd had to give up their homes and that because of that increased risk that that was justified or for, for others there was the low absolute risk of cancer sort of helped allay their fears so that was a really nice project. If you want to find some more stories about interesting research that's been done using linked data um, I've given you two links here. One's to impact stories that we put together about interesting research. And the second one is we have a searchable publications. So any publications that we know about that are Australian publications using linked data, we include in this database and you can search it by keyword or jurisdiction or that sort of thing. So if you're interested in looking for kinds of research, um, that's a resource for you. So let's have a think about how we link data. Um, now my slide here says there's four steps and there, there are four steps, um, but I like to think of it in three because it's easier. Um, essentially the first step is what I like to call separation. So the separation of identifiers from the content data. And then we take the identifiers and we use in the second step, which is linkage. So we use the linkage to work out if person A is the same person in data set A as person A in data set B. And then the third step is we provide the data to researchers to do interesting and exciting uh, analysis. So three steps three groups of people involved in the process. First of all, there's data custodians. So these are the people who have the legal responsibility for a particular data collection. Then we have data linkers. So data linkers can in fact be anybody, but in the world I work in, we have specialist data linkage units where you have people with specialist skills who link at scale. And that's their job. They actually do the linkage. And in order to maintain the separation, they don't have access to content data. They only have access to identifiers. And then the third group of people are the data users or the researchers. And this is, I'm presuming most of you who I'm talking to today, who would use the data for analysis and research. So I'll talk you through a little sort of animated example of how this works. So we're going to look at two records, each from two, diff two different data collections. So we've got from the health department, the admitted patients data collection, and we've got a hospital record there for someone to be called any citizen. And then we've got the second data custodian, who's the registrar of births, deaths and marriages. And this is a death record also for somebody called any citizen. And as you can see, the two records have similar names, similar addresses, um, and the same date of birth. So the first step in the linkage process is actually separation. So 
a copy is taken of the identifiers, the name, address, date of birth, and also the unique record ID for that record. And that is sent to a specialist data linkage unit. And when the data linkage unit receives these two records, <clears throat> they use, um, in most cases, probabilistic linkage methodology to work out the probability that the any citizen in the hospital record is the same person as the any citizen in the death record. And in this case, they say, yes, we think it is the same person. So that's a link. And when they find a link, they either, <clears throat> if they've never seen this person before, they create a brand new, what we call a linkage ID. It's just a unique person number. Um, but if they have seen that person ID, they add that link to that person's record. Now, the linkage units never release that linkage ID to anybody. But if a researcher is doing a research project and they want linked hospital and death records, they'll submit an application to the data linkage unit. And the data, if the data linkage unit determines that any citizen is part of the cohort requested, they will create a special, what we call a project linkage ID for any citizen and every other person in the cohort, which is just unique to that project. And this means that the researchers, if they're doing several different projects and any citizen might be in the cohort for all of those projects, they won't be able to link all of that extra data together. So it's a privacy preserving mechanism. So once the data linkage unit has worked out that any citizen should be in the cohort, of course, the data linkage unit don't have any citizen records. All they know is that any citizen lives at Wave Road, Beach Town, and that's his birth date. So what they do is then send the project linkage ID and the record IDs for those two records back to the relevant data custodians, who then separate the data again but this time they replace the identifiers with the project IDs. And then each of those data custodians can send those records to the researcher who can merge and then analyze that data um, without needing the names and addresses. Okay. So I mentioned probabilistic linkage, which is a very high quality, very accurate way of linking. Um, but there are other methods of linking and in different circumstances, different methods might be the more appropriate method. Um, we don't see a lot of manual linking going on anymore because this is just eyeballing two records and saying, I think they're the same person and it's incredibly labor intensive. And at the scales that people are working these days, it's mostly not practical. So, um, but we do see deterministic linkage, which is, just linking based on exact agreement of the selected match variables. And depending on the methodology you choose, you may say, well, then the name and address have to be an exact match. And then if they're an exact match, that's a match and anything else that doesn't match is not. So then if there are spelling mistakes or, you know, other typos or something, then you miss, you miss links. Um, so deterministic linkage only works well if you've got really high quality linking variables. And then the fourth type of linkage that um, is becoming more and more popular, but there's a range of different ways of doing it, uh, blindfolded linkage where in some way or other, either by hashing encryption or bloom filters, you uh, mask the actual uh, linkage variables so the linker doesn't know who the person is, basically. Um, okay. The other thing in Australia that we have to think a lot about is linking across state and Commonwealth jurisdictions or boundaries. As I mentioned earlier, because of our federated system, it's actually really important that we can link across these borders. Um, because of the states collect the hospital data and the Commonwealth collects the PBS data. So if you want pharmaceutical data, um, you're going to have to do a link between a state and Commonwealth. 
a population is mobile and there's significant cross-border flows of people. If you think about the population living along the New South Wales-Queensland border, for example, there's constant movement across that border for use of services. Um, we don't have any single national data collection where all the data for the nation sits. Um, and sometimes we need really large numbers. So if you're wanting to do rare disease or rare event research, you often need more data than can be collected from an individual jurisdiction. Um, the other issue for us in Australia that we don't have an enduring person identifier that can be used across all data collection. So we have a Medicare number in health, but you don't have Medicare numbers on uh, your education data, for example. So you can't use Medicare to, to link um, health to education. So that brings me to the PHRN, which is the organisation that I work for, and why, why we exist and what we do. So we're a national network of data linkage units, so these specialist units that mostly sit in uh, health departments across the country. Um, we provide secure data laboratories and other eReach services to support researchers accessing linked population level data. So this is a little map of where all of our units sit. So um, I work in the National Coordinating Office in Perth, and then each state has a data linkage unit. The two territories partner with one of the states because they're a bit small to have their own linkage unit. So South Australia does the linkage for Northern Territory and New South Wales does the linkage for ACT. And then we also support the AIHW uh, linkage unit, which does a lot of Commonwealth linkage and also helps us with the linkage of state to Commonwealth data. Now, this diagram is not super easy to see, um, but I'll try and explain it to you. So the overall concept of the network is, so the, the outer ring is the data ring and it's divided into each jurisdiction. So essentially, there's data collected in each jurisdiction, including administrative data, clinical data, research data. That all gets linked at a jurisdictional level by the jurisdictional linkage units. And then we have ways to link between the jurisdictional linkage units. So we have been working for quite some time. So we do it mostly on ad hoc basis. So one off linkages between for particular projects, but we're working on the methodology for making this more routine so that we link all of these sort of annually. So it makes it quicker. Then once the linkage is done, the data is provided in some kind of a secure environment. That might be the Shaw facility at the Sachs Institute, or it might be the Shrey facility at the AHW, or it might be a secure facility in your research, in your uh, university. And then hopefully the researchers write lots of fabulous publications and they get translated and everybody's health gets better. Um, so the PHRN, we've been around for a while now. We were founded in 2009. Um, we have about 113 staff working across all of the different units. Um, we link a lot of data. Um, so more than 18 billion records have been accessed. Well, that's, yeah, to date. Um, we've dealt with thousands of applications for data. Uh, and as a result of that, there are, well, we're probably up to close to 2000 publications by now, because that's from last year's numbers. So we've been busy. Um, if you want to know more about the PHRN, there's a couple of publications there that give you an overview of what we do. And the second one's really a history of data linkage in Australia, because Australia has a very long history of systematic linked data. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. So that might be interesting. So, okay, so there's this infrastructure that exists. There's all this data sitting around the country. How do you get your hands on it? Um, 
Well, we offer some services to help you find data that you might be interested in linking. So you can go to our website and in our for researchers section, you can find a range of metadata around the commonly linked, routinely linked data collections um, in all of the jurisdictions. Um, and when you have a look in there, you'll get a description of the data collection, the date range that the data is available, um, what data linkage unit is responsible for linking that particular data collection um, and links to any metadata that's available. Not all data collections do have fabulous metadata, but some of them do. And some of them also have links to validation studies um, if they're available. Um, so this is just a list of all of the data linkage units in the country and where to contact them and to find out what data is. So in our website, we have the most commonly linked data collections. In each of the jurisdictions, they often list additional data sets that they either might have linked once in the past or may occasionally link um, sort of less regularly linked data. So if you're really wanting to drill down into all the possibilities of what they could link for you, it's probably better to go to the individual linkage unit website. So this is just the example of the Cheryl website, so the New South Wales linkage unit website and what it might look like their sort of list of data collections. So these are the data collections that are in there, what they call their master linkage key. So these are the ones with enduring linkages that they update the linkages all the time. And then if you click on any one of those, that'll give you what additional information is available about that um, data collection, including the variable list and the data dictionary, um, which are really important. Um, sources of information if you want to understand what the data can and can't do for you. Because um, not all data can meet all needs. Um, if you're wanting to do a cross jurisdictional linkage, um, then you can also find out what data collections are available in the same timeframes um, across all of the states by going to our website there and this shows you these sorts of GAN charts. So this is the um, hospital admitted patients data which shows you for example that WA you can get hospital data back to 1980 but if you're actually wanting to do a cross-jurisdictional project then realistically you probably can only go back as far as about 2005 if you don't want to include Tasmania. If you want everybody then you're safer to go you can probably only go back to 2010. Anyway, you have to, when you're designing your studies, think about when's the data actually available to me. And then if you, once you've designed your project and you've decided what data that you would like to access and have linked for you, um, if it's just from a single jurisdiction, then you go direct to that single jurisdiction data linkage unit and they each have their own um, application process and application form, um, which they all have described on their websites. You submit the data application to the DLU. Each data linkage unit has a client services team. So these are people who are experienced in the application and approval processes, and they actually often know quite a bit about the data as well and what data can and can't do for you, or whether your um, application will be feasible. They will look at your application and provide you with advice about the feasibility of the linkage and some of the data and provide you with some feedback They'll tell you when your application's ready for ethics approval. And once you've got ethics approval, <clears throat> you need both ethics approval and data custody approval before you have all the approvals required. Once you have the approvals required, then the data will be linked and it will be provided to you in whatever the approved location is. That'll depend on your project and what data. Access to cross-jurisdictional linked data is a little bit more complex because you're linking and there are 
different rules and regulations in every jurisdiction in Australia. And also there are some complexities about how we actually work out how to do the linkage, depending on the data collections involved. So sometimes a cross jurisdictional linkage might involve, you know, three or four different linkage units doing part of the linkage in order to get the data in the format and the linkage that you're requesting. So we have a national online application system. Um, you can get to that through our website. I'll give you a link. Um, and you submit in the first instance it's an expression of interest. That gets every jurisdiction that you've requested data from immediately gets an alert that you've submitted an application. And then the coordinators of client services that work in my office, um, they then organise to meet with all of the jurisdictions involved and discuss the feasibility of your project and provide you with uh, joint feedback um, on that. And then they will tick tack with you until we have a feasible project written that we think A, we can do and B, data custodians would likely approve. Then we convert your expression of interest to a full application and it gets sent for data custodian review and then for ethics approval. And when you've got your final approval, we link the data and again, provide access to it in whatever location has been approved for your particular project. Um, there's some more information you can find out about the application and approval processes um, on the website. There's quite a few videos now on our YouTube channel. Um, we just recently released a series of three sort of explanatory about you know, how to design a project, how does the cross-jurisdictional application process work. Um, and there's also, yeah, there's a couple of little videos on there as well. So, and if you're interested in clinical trials, there's also a whole series on clinical trials, series of four different webinars on clinical trials. So that's worth looking up if that's your particular interest. Um, this is just a shameless plug. If you are interested in ethics and governance and those sorts of things, um, I've got a book that I'm one of the authors on that is being published next week. So have a look at that if that's something that you might be interested in. And then that's just our contact details. Um, if you're interested in keeping up to date with what's happening in the cross-jurisdictional data linkage world, um, you can sign up on our website, subscribe to our quarterly newsletter um, and our mailing list, keep an eye on our Twitter um, and our news site on the website.